Well, you see, I, I've always maintained that the biggest challenge for my generation would be how we cope with the end of the European divide. To go from that to a situation where the wall comes down, where the European divide stops, that is, I was, I've always said, the most important event in my life. And I want, wanted to dedicate my professional life to manage the consequences of that, to make sure that we could handle it, that we could integrate Central and Eastern Europe into the European project, that we could offer what the people there wanted, freedom, openness, transparency, all the things that they had lacked during communist oppression. And I think, frankly, looking back now, with all the mistakes that were made and all the problems that arose, it is a spectacular, a spectacular success of historic proportions. And I believe we should be proud of that, that we are as Europeans. I think for me personally, the biggest change for me was that to, to challenge the premise that Europe needs to be constructed at the expense of the nation state, that we can only do the European things by taking them away from the nation state. I think that premise was wrong. I think Europe can only be constructed with the nation states. The nation states need to be reinvigorated. Their sovereignty needs to be reinvented and recharged, as it were, through Europe. I never believed in the, in the idea of Spitzen coming back. I thought it was a political game. I, I thought it wouldn't bring anything. I thought at the end of the day, the European Council would decide anyway. But boy, was I wrong. I was wrong on this. Massively wrong. The fact that they chose to have Spitzen coming back gave Jean-Claude Juncker a position that is more independent from national governments and from the European Council than any of his predecessors before him. Um, so, political commission means a president of the commission who has the room to be more political than his predecessors because he can say no to big member states, um, with measure, of course, but still to a much larger degree than his predecessors because he got his mandate in accordance with the European Parliament and, of course, you know, the European Council endorsed it. Um, but it wasn't their choice. And that has a huge political effect on the relationship between the institutions. Um, so the Commission is now, thanks to Jean-Claude Juncker, in a position to be more independent. And when he says it's last chance commission, it is a commission that is more independent and therefore tries to be the commission as intended in the treaty, which is to be uh, not a secretary general of the European Council, neither a slave to the European Parliament. So we need to ascertain our own position and need to say no sometimes. And, and saying no to the European Parliament, and the European Parliament said, like, hang on, the Commission said no, we're not used to that anymore. So both the European Council and the European Parliament have to get used to this new role of the Commission. And frankly, the Commission itself has to get used to that role. And I see it as my duty to, to sort of help Commission structures get used to that role. Because you know, the Commission is traditionally, and has become over the years more and more, a, a huge collection of silos. Um, silos that shall never meet um, and do their business within the silo. And with a new structure with vice presidents, and, you know, we're breaking down the silo. Uh, and that is creating much more political momentum at a much earlier stage. We discuss policy across different policy areas at a much earlier stage than. Uh, is to be done uh, before, and that creates more political momentum as well. To paraphrase Mark Twain, uh, you know, the, the uh, announcement of our demise is a bit premature. Um, uh, Europe has a lot to offer to the world. Uh, we have, um, I think, um, the highest educated population uh, across the board from any part of the world. We have the strongest and best social systems of the world. Uh, we have the healthiest, uh, best educated, uh, youngest generation of the world. Uh, we have many things going for us, but we don't see it like that. We think, you know, we, we're in a sort of end of days mode, uh, which I, I think is totally unjustified. Um, 
I'm not going to change that by speeches, even if I make great speeches, that will not change. And where we are taking down silos in the Commission, I see in European society silos emerging all over the place in society. I can take a very personal example. My oldest daughter, she's 28, she is a pharmacist assistant. My oldest son, he's 26, he's a lawyer. They live in different worlds, literally in different worlds. They worry about different things. My son worries about global uh, problems. My daughter worries about whether she can pay the rent by the end of the month. And this is the same generation, two people who love each other dearly, who would do anything for each other, but sometimes don't under understand each other's world. And this is happening in young generations all across the Western world, especially in Europe. Don't, they don't share, you know, you can get together at the global system. We're all on the same line, but there's there's at least as many people out there who don't understand that commitment to the rest of the world because they have different worries. And that's where my, where I believe, uh, where social democracy, if I can make it political, is dying. It's because we're no longer building bridges. We're returning to a situation where politics will be formulated as politics serving one specific interest. And that, how you do that in a complex Democratic society, I don't see it. I don't see it working. So we need to get together with people in social uh, networks, with people in, in, in civil society, to make sure that we start developing the concept of building bridges between people with different interests and creating coalitions based on shared interests. Where is a shared interest in our society? Where is it? Can we formulate it across social boundaries, across ethnic boundaries, across um, uh, uh, age boundaries, can we formulate something that we have in common? That is where the future lies in democratic politics, and I'm not sure we're well equipped to get where we need to be. Since borders between nation states in Europe are no longer a source of threats, the necessity for nation states to repress diversity within their borders has largely diminished. So, nation states, because of European integration, have become extremely relaxed about cultural differences within their borders. Um, the Dutch language was suppressed for generations in the north of France, because France saw it as a threat to its territorial integrity. Now, the Dutch language is flourishing, and there's a lot of Dutch language taught in the north of France, and people think that is very interesting. Same happened with German in the east of France. Same happens with regional languages in many, many nations. And so I would see the pro process of regionalization as a, a product of European integration. It's not a contradiction with European integration. The beauty of European integration is to take that problem away. It leads to a new problem, which is um, uh, the uh, striving for independence of regions. You see it in Belgium, you see it in, in the United Kingdom, you see it in in Spain, and interestingly enough, all these subnational entities, regional entities, have one desire in common to be a full fledged member of a European project. They are extremely federalist because they believe the European Union is the answer for them to uh, what they perceive as an oppressive nation state. But the answer is not in political rhetoric. The biggest thing you can do um, populist politicians is to answer their populism with your populism. It only increases the support they can create for their own position. So we have legal instruments to be very precise, to analyze um, laws and propositions. If we really get into the heart of the matter and are very precise, on the legal instruments, um, we can correct it. And every time they will give in to our criticism, every time until now, once we say, no, here you really cross the line, you should be doing this, they come back. Having said that, there's one thing we cannot really do anything about if member states are not willing to address that amongst themselves. Just one example. The refugee crisis we're now facing. All the proposals that were agreed are commission proposals. 
all the proposals challenge are also commission proposals, but we, you know, we took a huge risk. We didn't go to member states first and ask, oh, is that okay with you? No, we took the step. The distribution key was something member states, some member states uh, disliked, but we made an analysis of how we could solve this issue of one member state saying, you know, you take care of your own problems, I go to look away, it's been do, going on for years. How do we get out of that situation? We thought about it long and hard, and the only concrete uh, uh, response to that would be show solidarity. And the only way of doing that is in crisis situations, have a distribution key so that people, you know, bear the brunt together. The solidarity. Quality of our proposals, um, the diplomacy that we apply in talking to member states about this, the balance we see between the different interests because the ones had an interest in not being left with all the refugees only in their country and the others had an interest in making sure that the countries where people arrive and apply the rules which they hadn't been doing for a long time. We create a balance in those <coughs> proposals to achieve both goals and it might work. So now, we're now in a better position on that than we were before. But Make no mistake, this problem will not go away. It will be a long-term issue for Europe. And Europe to understand that it is no longer um, a continent of origin, but it's becoming a continent of destination, uh, like the United States and others. That psychological change is perhaps the, most, the biggest challenge we face. First of all, be frank about the complexity of the problems. People accept your frankness. People are increasingly fed up with simplistic solutions. But we're in a situation where my complex answer, if it is not believed or it doesn't have any perspective, and the simplistic solution, many people say, okay, the complex answer is not working. Who knows, a simplistic one might. Let's follow that politician. That's the situation we're in in Europe. That's why the extreme right is on the rise in Europe. So, all the issues you mentioned, energy, refugees, unemployment, the problem is a lack of perspective. What is the point we're heading to? And how do you communicate that by not treating people like simpletons? The, the temptation in politics for too long now has been to make things not just uncomplicated in language, but simple in content, and that is wrong. Your language has to be uncomplicated, but if you try and convince people that there are simple solutions to complex problems, you're in the middle of the minefield of populism. Many of the things they want, I want, uh, the Commission wants, uh, we want Europe to you know, concentrate on the main issues. We want uh, a less red tape for small and medium-sized enterprises. We want to make sure that the internal market functions better. We want a capital markets union. We want um, an energy union. The United Kingdom wants all of that. So we can work on that, but then of course there are changes they want in the treaty. We'll listen to them, we'll try and advise them to do that, and we'll try and find a common solution. But at the end of the day, uh, David Cameron will have to make up his mind whether what he can negotiate in Brussels with his colleagues and with us is something he wants to take to the British voter with a, a, um, a clear uh, position that uh, the UK should stay in the European Union. But it's up to the British people. It's been made into a referendum. So now it's up to the British people to decide. And we will abide by the result. And we will try and advise uh, where we can um, from the position, from my personal position, that I believe it's absolutely in the EU's interest to keep the UK on board. I'm even so arrogant to say that it's blatantly interest to stay in uh, uh, the EU, 